different colleagues, welcome to our 2022 Elizabeth of Bohemia Award ceremony. Let me say first a few words on Elizabeth of Bohemia. The importance, about the importance she had in this region, in East Westphalia, Lippe, close to Paderborn, about 30 to 40 kilometers from here, Elizabeth of Bohemia lived, and here she is better known as Elizabeth, Princess Bishop of Hereford. Elizabeth and her younger sister Sophie became both famous supporters of Leibniz. They both cultivated an extensive philosophical network. Both were key figures in European politics, and some even don't know that they were sisters. As daughters of Elizabeth Stuart, they enforced the Act of Settlement, which secured the right of the Hanoveranians to the English throne. And here again, in my praise of the philosopher Elizabeth of Bohemia, I cannot help but point out what I see as an outstanding element when we look at the history of women philosophers. It is also their being independent from the mainstream and partly, of course, they had to be. Being a young and gifted and unprejudiced and unbiased student, I think, Elizabeth of Bohemia asked critical questions to her teacher Descartes about a philosophy of two substances a theory which, incidentally, was fiercely dismantled by Du Chatelet. Elizabeth used her political influence to stand up for persecuted religious groups. In her thought, she granted asylum to the Labadists and also her longtime friend, the famous Anna Schumann which is surely also today worth being noted. In 2018, representatives of philosophy from all over the world were guests in Hereford and at the center on the occasion of the fourth centenary of Elizabeth of the Palatine's birthday. Sarah Hutton had her role in this. In 2018, the Elizabeth of Bohemia and her prize was awarded for the first time. Since 2018, the prize is donated by Professor Dr. Ulrike Detmers. And I'm personally very grateful to Professor Detmers She's quite well known in Germany. Last weekend, she had the management prize and, and so on. But she is very much committed to philosophy. She acknowledges the need to support the public awareness that women have contributed to the philosophical tradition and that it is important to celebrate our knowledge that women of past centuries the active philosophers who raised their voices and have been heard in former times. This year prize is awarded to an outstanding contemporary philosopher in memory of Elizabeth of Bohemia, Sarah Hutton. Now I warmly welcome Michael Beeney for the honorific speech in honor of Sarah Hutton. Michael Beeney, 
former chief editor of the British Journal for the History of Philosophy, renowned scholar in the history of analytic philosophy since 2009, professor for analytic philosophy in New York, 2020 reaches professor of logic at the University of Aberdeen, and professor of the history of analytic philosophy at the Humboldt University in Berlin, and member of the decision committee for the award of the Elizabeth of Bohemia Prize. Dear Mike, please provide the speech. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth, for that. And Sarah, good to see you somewhere, even if we can't be actually in physical presence, it's good to see you virtually. Okay, so on behalf of the committee that awards the annual Elizabeth of Bohemia Prize to a scholar, who's made an outstanding contribution to our understanding of the work of women philosophers in history, I'm honored and delighted to give the Laudatio in awarding this year's prize to Professor Sarah Hutton in recognition of all that she's achieved in this field over many years. Sarah is not only one of our most distinguished historians of early modern philosophy with internationally recognized expertise in Cambridge Platonism and women philosophers in the early modern period, but also one of the most active scholars in promoting the history of early modern philosophy and the work of women philosophers in particular. Sarah took her undergraduate degree at Newhall, now Murray Edwards College, one of just three colleges for women at the University of Cambridge, and gained her PhD from the Warburg Institute, University of London in 1978. She was lecturer and then reader in Renaissance and 17th century studies at the University of Hertfordshire before moving to Middlesex University in 1999, becoming Professor of Early Modern Studies in 2004. In 2007, she moved to Aberystwyth University where she was Professor until she retired in 2014. She's currently Honorary Visiting Professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of York. She's had a series of visiting fellowships at Cambridge, Florence, Paris, Columbia University and Princeton, among other places. She published widely in her fields of interest. As Ruth mentioned, her first book was Anne Conway, a woman philosopher, which appeared with Cambridge University Press in 2004. This was the first intellectual biography of Anne Conway, who lived from 1631 to 1679, and whose main work was The Principles of the Most Ancient and Modern Philosophy, published anonymously in Latin in 1690 and in English in 1692. This developed a Platonist metaphysics rooted in the attributes of God, aimed at refuting the dualism of Descartes and Henry Moore and the material pantheism that she saw in Hobbes and Spinoza's philosophies. Sarah had early produced a revised edition of Conway's Correspondence, published in 1992, and she also wrote the entry on Conway in the Stanford Encyclopedia in 2003, even before her book appeared. The second entry published on a woman philosopher the first, which appeared one month earlier, was on Lady de Maris Masham, also by Sarah. So she really got things going here. It was substantially revised in 2020, and it's interesting to see from the bibliography how work on Conway, as well as on Masham, has taken off since Sarah's groundbreaking scholarship. Her book was described by Eileen O'Neill in the Journal of the History of Philosophy as dazzlingly erudite and a tour de force of historical scholarship. Her second book appeared in 2050, British Philosophy in the 17th Century, in the prestigious series on the history of philosophy published by Oxford University Press. The introduction to this book provides a beautifully written statement of her historiography. Rightly rejecting the idea that Bacon, Hobbes and Locke are the only philosophers of their time in Britain, she goes on, so quote, my starting point will be what constituted philosophy for the 17th century. I focus on individuals rather than particular branches of philosophy as an ongoing conversation, as a means of setting philosophers in relation to one another. Like all conversations, some voices will dominate, some will be more persuasive than others, and there'll be enormous variations in tone from the polite to polemical, fair-minded, matter-of-fact, loquacious, reticent, and temperate. The conversation model allows voices to be heard which would otherwise be discounted. By this means, I provide what might be called a thick description of 17th century intellectual culture, 
setting marginal and major thinkers within a more integrated account of 17th century philosophy, which attempts to view it in its own terms, taking account of institutions and the modes of circulation of ideas. I set the philosophy of Bacon, Hobbes and Locke in relation to the philosophical context within which it was produced. Context made up of figures normally regarded as minor players in philosophy, e.g. Herbert of Cherbury, Cudworth, Moore, Berthog, Norris, Tolland, as well as others who have been completely overlooked, notably female philosophers. End of citation. There are indeed chapters on Bacon and Herbert of Cherbury, Hobbes and Locke, but also on, these are names of the title chapters, An Age of Transformation, Philosophy of the Universities, Cross Currents, Conduits and Conversations, the Cambridge Platonists and Free Thinkers, Idealists and Women Philosophers, to mention some of the other chapters. Reviewers describe the book as magnificent, a rich and fascinating portrayal of what Hutton aptly terms 17th century philosophy in action, and quote again, an impeccable work of scholarship and one that will serve as an essential point of reference for years to come. Sarah's editorial work has been no less impressive, including both edited texts and edited collections. As well as, well as Conway's correspondence already mentioned, she's edited two treaties by Ralph Cudworth and Richard Ward's Life of Henry Moore. The 11 collections she's edited or co-edited include volumes on Moore, Platonism, early modern women scientists, Newtonianism, Benjamin Furley, Locke, early modern women philosophers, and most recently, Elizabeth of Bohemia. She's published numerous articles in refereed journals and chapters of books, once again focusing on the Cambridge Platonists and early modern women philosophers. From all the entries she's written for encyclopedias and dictionaries, she's clearly been the first port of call for anything on the Cambridge Platonists and early modern English women philosophers. She's undoubtedly the leading world expert in these two fields. As mentioned at the beginning, Sarah has also been highly active in promoting the history of early modern philosophy and intellectual history and history of philosophy more generally. Here I must single out her work for both the British Society for the History of Philosophy and the British Journal for the History of Philosophy. Sarah was involved with both from their inception. She was chair of the BSHP from 1996 to 2004 and was on the editorial board of the BJHP from when it was founded by John Rogers in 1993 to the end of 2020. I joined the BSHP Management Committee in 1995, serving on it in one capacity or other until the end of 2020, and became an associate editor of the BJHP in 2008, taking over from John Rogers as editor in 2011 until I retired nearly two years ago, though I remain an associate editor. So I've worked closely with Sarah on the BSHP and BJHP for 25 years, and must pay tribute to everything she's done for both over that long period. She served for two terms as chair of the BSHP at a time when history of philosophy was not recognized nearly as much as it is today, and when it was difficult to get younger philosophers interested in the field. The BJHP was founded to give a higher profile to history of philosophy in Britain, and to provide another venue for research alongside more established journals, such as the Journal of the History of Philosophy, founded in 1963, and the History of Philosophy Quarterly, founded in 1984. Initially focused on early modern philosophy and on their mountains, as Sarah called them in the introduction to her book, the journal has gradually been broadening out ever since. As the longest serving member of the editorial board of the BJHP, she was on it for 27 years, Sarah has played a major role in all these developments, encouraging and refereeing submissions, advising on policies, and most importantly of all, guest editing two special issues that have contributed to broadening the canon. The first on Cambridge Platonism came out in September 2017, and the second on women philosophers in early modern philosophy, as Ruth mentioned, co-edited with her in July 20, 2019. Sarah's own contribution to the second special issue was given as the annual lecture of the BSHP in 2018, entitled Women, Philosophy and the History of Philosophy. It reviews developments in the study of women philosophers over the last 30 years or so, picking up on historiographical issues that she'd addressed in earlier papers and makes recommendations for future work. It's the ideal paper to consider 
on this special occasion of the award of the Elizabeth of Bohemia Prize. So let me end by briefly commenting on this. As Sarah rightly notes, quote, it's sobering to reflect on how recently the climate of receptivity towards female philosophers has developed, pretty much within the lifetime of the British Journal for the History of Philosophy, end citation. Indeed, it is astonishing how much the climate has changed over the last 25 years. There's been a shift from negative stories of disadvantage, as Sarah puts it, to more positive accounts of the work of women philosophers, aided by the addition of texts and the organization of conferences, in which Sarah has also played a leading role, as well as a general attitude, change in attitude towards history of philosophy as a discipline, led by the Cambridge Contextualist School, of which Sarah has been an influential member. Emphasizing a point she made in earlier papers, she writes, again, quote, historical research is essential, not just for the recovery of women philosophers, but also for enabling us to discuss them meaningfully in terms that make sense to us without diminishing the alterity of past philosophy, either women's philosophy or men's, end of citation. Sarah's work on women philosophers has especially brought out the importance of appreciating the alterity of their philosophizing. What this requires in practice is again, quote from her, openness to genre, to different philosophical idioms and to other philosophical priorities, as she puts it. This has resonated very strongly in my own work over the last 10 years on ancient Chinese philosophy, where the alterity is even more striking. For me, the most pressing challenge now to philosophy and history of philosophy, as they're practiced in Europe in the English speaking world is to recognize and converse with other philosophical voices such as Chinese, Indian, Islamic and African to name just some. Here the pioneering work of Sarah Hutton and all those other scholars of the writings of women philosophers in the history of European philosophy will provide essential advice and models to follow in meeting this challenge. Elizabeth of Bohemia would, I'm sure, have approved. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, my queen, very much. So, is this me now? So, thank you, uh, my queen, for this uh, speech. And, Sarah Hutton, may I ask you to join me and to uh, receive the award of the Elizabeth of Bohemia 2022? Please welcome with me. Again, Sarah Hutton, professor in the history of ideas, renowned scholar, and the awardee of this uh, thing. <laughs> this is a certificate. <laughs> this is a certificate. Yeah. Oh my goodness, thank you. Very much. Yes, this is. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much. Well, um, I hope Mike can see me. Um, I, I would first just like to, uh, Ed Memoir here, um, I, I have to say it's a great honour to be awarded this prize and um, uh, I, I would like to thank the judge, judging panel for, for their decision and particular thanks to Mike for his uh, very generous laudatio and um, uh, for saying so much, um, yes, it's quite embarrassing to hear it all. <laughs> Makes me feel quite old, actually, to, hear, to be reminded about how long I've been associated with some of these many causes. But I would also like to make some... Um, so, th so thank you heartily, Mike. It's been really great to work with you, and this is um, a very special occasion. I'm sorry you're not here to, to, to be with us in person. But I'd also like to make some other acknowledgements. Um, first of all, in particular, to Dr. Ulrika uh, um, uh, Detmers, uh, who funds this prize, um, and particularly because uh, it, it, the, the sheer symbolism of this, I think, is, is so important. Um, here is a very successful businesswoman who thinks that philosophy matters. And this gives the... <laughs> 
this gives the lie to all the all the story, all the mantras we are told constantly about the irrelevance of the humanities. But, but what is to, to to the real the real world? What is particularly important about this that is that here is a woman um, who uh, shows that in the world of business, intelligent women matter. And what a better way to show this than by awarding a prize for work on intelligent women philosophers. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge Ruth because uh, as you will realize, I've known Ruth now for some time, but really she's been indefatigable in promoting the cause of, of the history of women philosophers, building up this center um, and all, all the activities as associated with it. Um, it's particularly appropriate, I think, that I've been awarded this prize at a conference on Emily de Châtelet, because as she reminded us just now, um, I first met Ruth uh, in 2006, uh, in Potsdam, where she had organised a conference on Emily du Châtelet um, of, uh, uh, and, and invited me uh, on the strength of a paper that I published. Um, and it was the first time someone in Europe had, had, had actually, you know, so, suddenly I sat up and realised someone was reading my, what I published, and that was a very satisfying feeling. I may say I travelled there from Aberystwyth. It took me longer to get to London from Aberystwyth than to fly from, Aber from London to, 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 to Berlin. Um, but that's the kind of place that Aber is. Um, and, um, but I also very glad that uh, Mike mentioned uh, my association with the British, British Society with History of Philosophy, because there again, I, I, I would like to acknowledge the society because it, it, it's um, and especially appropriate, therefore, that Mike. Not, it's another reason why it's appropriate. Mike has given the laudatio. My very first um, article on a woman philosopher was published in the British Journal for the History of Philosophy, and um, it, this society has been a mainstay for for, some, for someone like me, whose most of whose career was spent teaching in the kind of universities where research was not valued, and so the value. The value and the opportunities that the British Society gave me are, are, have been very important for me. And I particularly mention the conference held in 1992 um, that I organised with Susan James and Jonathan Ray on women philosophers, the first of its kind in, um, in the UK, and uh, the British Society, the fledgling British Society for the History of Philosophy um, uh, sponsored it. And uh, I, I need say no more about the, the aims of that, that, that society and its importance for, for, for women in philosophy. And thinking about that conference and now uh, is just a reminder about how much has changed. We had some difficulty in filling the programme then. Um, and it wasn't just for lack of funds. It was that there weren't many people working on uh, um, the field. Um, Eileen O'Neill was the exception, she was our keynote speaker, but getting a coherent programme was, was, was something of a challenge. It was an eye-opener of conference. It was um, uh, uh, the people who came, a majority woman audience. Um, it was obviously striking a note that it was, it, something was going on and, and, and had, had to be happening. And it was one of the most collegiate conferences I ever, had ever attended. No, no sort of grandstanding and 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 and, and, and combative uh, presentations. It, it was it was highly collaborative, and um, uh, but of course, how much has changed? Um, as we go forward, work is being done on women from antiquity up to up to the present, um, and I'm happy to say that uh, Mike's journal has been leading the way here. Um, and as we go forward, of course, this is a, an exciting project, pr prospect, um, because uh, it, the really, we are really, I think we're past the point of threshold when it comes to the game changing of, of the, the um, on, 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 on women philosophers. And it's going to have an enormous impact, I'm sure, on philosophy and, and how we think about philosophy, because you really have to rethink what philosophy is and has been. Um, and that has, as Mike pointed out, huge implications for 
how, I, I, how we think about philosophy beyond the European American tradition. I eschew the word Western. I've never, never, read. having been born on the equator, I find Western is not a very useful concept to, to, um, to, 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 to utilize. But um, uh, as we go forward, I would just like to sound a few words of caution. Um, I sounded some in my lecture at the British Society about forgetting how difficult it has been for women in philosophy, forgetting about how difficult it has been for scholars who've tried to work on them. Um, I described that as the, the new uh, amnesia. And, and I would like to make an appeal for us to, to take forward what we've learned from our, our work on, on women and um, in the, of the past and to avoid replicating the kind of um, the kind of ways of doing philosophy that 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 had actually got in the way of, of us recovery, uh, the women. So um, um, I look forward to uh, f further work in both this field and others of, uh, that goes forward in a gener gen uh, spirit of generosity. Um, and in a non-competitive way of, of, of shared enterprise. The history of women philosophers is still being written. It's the younger generations who are write, writing it. And it is, for someone like me who's been chipping away at this for so many years, it is just wonderful to see how the demand is there and um, the enthusiasm is there and people, people are doing it. So I'm um, uh, naturally very happy to have contributed to this, um, this movement. Um, it means a great deal to me to be recognised by the Elizabeth of Bohemia Award. Thank you very much.